Happy Monday. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch, Case Cracked. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery. And today's mystery seems to have a lot of failures along the way. But it is Case Cracked. Justice does actually show up. This is one that we like to call the disappearing witness. It's August 1st, 2000 in Mayfield, Kentucky. An officer, Tim Fortner, has been assigned to a case that is like nothing he's ever seen. Fortner, a former deputy jailer, had been called that morning to the local middle school to investigate a fire. But as he drew closer, he could see that this was more than just a fire. At the school, he found the decomposing body of a black teenage girl. Only partially dressed, her clothes and skin were badly burned. Around her neck, Fortner could see the remains of a charred belt, along with a plastic bottle sitting near her feet that smelled as though it had recently contained gasoline. Fortner was dumbstruck. The man had never handled an investigation before, let alone a possible murder. With no clue as to how to organize a crime scene or look for evidence, he began the task of transporting the body and bagging what few items were nearby. Because the body was so badly burned, very little DNA evidence could be found, and the cause of death could not be definitively determined. The local medical examiner believed that the young woman was murdered by strangulation based on the presence of the charred leather belt found at the scene. From day one, this investigation was not going well. Before vital evidence could be stored in the evidence room at police headquarters, it simply vanished. Fortunately, it didn't take the local PD long to figure out who their victim was. The very same afternoon that the body was found, local residents Joe and Jean Curran came to the police station to report their 18-year-old daughter, Jessica, missing after she failed to return home from a friend's house. With what few items remained, they were able to make a positive identification. As police began canvassing the town, they learned that people in the community were reluctant to share anything. However, they were able to track down a young girl named Victoria Caldwell, who claimed to be a witness to the crime. Terrified to come forward, she was immediately put into police protection, but soon after, she disappeared. Jessica's heartbroken family knew of no enemies their daughter had, except maybe the father of their daughter's son, Jeremy Adams. Jessica had only recently given birth to Zion after she claimed that she and Adams had non-consensual sex. Adams was a petty criminal and small-time drug user who was currently in the local jail on charges. From his interview, officers learned that Adams had claimed that Jessica threatened to tell his current girlfriend that he was Zion's father. They believed it was possible he and a friend named Carlos Saxton had killed Jessica to keep her quiet. Now, they had a possible motive for this horrible crime. Two years after her murder, Mayfield PD still only had the same two suspects they claimed had murdered Jessica. The two men were taken into custody. However, investigators had almost nothing to back up the charges. Evidence from her rape kit had been irrevocably damaged, when it was shoved into an evidence box that contained kits from other cases. Jessica's clothes, which might have contained important clues to the murderer's identity, were somehow destroyed by being burned. Before the end, even a psychic was employed, but their leads took investigators nowhere. All this time, the Curran family had walked and held rallies and vigils in Jessica's honor, not only to keep her memory alive, but to force police to look at her murder. The Currens were very critical of how police were handling their daughter's case. Now, at least, they thought that their daughter's murderers were in custody and would soon go to trial. But that would not happen. Days before the case was set to be heard, the presiding judge unexpectedly dismissed all charges. He had found that the Mayfield Police Department withheld 18 pieces of evidence in their investigation into Adams and Saxton that cast serious doubt on whether or not they were the actual perpetrators. The judge exclaimed, I have never seen a case so encumbered with problems, and I hope I never see one again. During this time, Jessica's family wasn't the only one working to find their daughter's killer. 
the day that Jessica was found on that middle school ball field, a small crowd had gathered to watch. In that crowd was a woman named Susan Galbraith. Susan was a Chicago native who had moved to Kentucky after her marriage. She had witnessed what so few others had, the horrific condition Jessica had been left in. She followed Jessica's case and the police department's less than stellar investigation closely and finally decided that she could no longer stand this killer going free. In April 2004, she gathered all of her evidence, theories, and musings and sent them in a cold email to senior BBC reporter Tom Mangold. She had admired the man's work while watching 60 Minutes and had become frustrated in her own dealing with local law enforcement. Maybe someone as experienced as Mangold could give this case the boost it needed. To her surprise, Jessica's murder intrigued him, and he offered to fly to Kentucky to visit with her and police to offer what help he could. Right off the bat, Mangold sensed hostility from local authorities and residents. No one, it seemed, wanted to talk about Jessica, let alone find her killer. As her family and friends continued to hold rallies, Mangold and Galbraith, in their investigation, continued to run across the same name over and over. There were whispers that local drug dealer Quincy Cross was responsible. As a matter of fact, most of Mayfield seemed aware that Cross was at least involved, but no one would speak on the record or testify. That same year, as Jessica's family petitioned the new Kentucky Attorney General to look at her case, state police were taking over the investigation and had decided to ask for Susan's help. She had made enough inquiries around town about Cross, a convicted sex offender and known drug dealer, that the man had started to follow her. State police wanted her to confront him and question him about the murder. In February of 2005, Susan posed as a true crime author doing research on the Curran murder. Unbeknownst to Cross, state police had fitted her with a wire to record the meeting. Under questioning, Cross revealed very little, but closely questioned her about DNA evidence and the belt used to strangle Jessica. Even though he didn't say anything incriminating, he did display knowledge of the case that had not been released to the public. Unfortunately, even with the recording, state police believe they still didn't have enough evidence for an arrest or conviction. Finally, in 2006, things started to come together. That fall, Joe Curran convinced the new attorney general to assign his daughter's case to the Kentucky Bureau of Investigation, a local field office for the FBI. When their agents arrived in town, they were immediately stonewalled by hostility from the local police and the local population. Their investigation was quickly stalling out. After her disappointing meeting with Cross, Susan had not sat idle either. She had worked to draw up a MySpace tribute page called Justice for Jessica, in which she hoped to gather new information. In February 2007, a woman in California who identified herself as Victoria Caldwell posted this message in the comments section. I will help the police as much as I can, but I really don't know who to trust. I'm afraid someone might kill me if I testify to things about this, can you help me? This was, in fact, the same Victoria Caldwell who had vanished while under police protection at the start of the investigation. During their conversations, Caldwell admitted that several people had witnessed Quincy Cross kill Jessica Curran. Susan took her information to the newly assigned investigators. From there, they hurried to California, where Caldwell identified the perpetrator as Quincy Cross, the same suspect that Galbraith had interviewed. After Caldwell agreed to testify against Cross, investigators brought her back to Kentucky in protective custody to await trial. Under questioning, Caldwell explained that the evening of the 29th, Cross and his accomplices, herself, her cousin Tamara Caldwell, Venetia Stubblefield, Jeffrey Burton and Quincy Cross were driving around while they were high on marijuana, cocaine, pills, and alcohol. The group had partied hard all evening while Cross insisted constantly that he wanted a woman. As they drove around, the group happened upon Jessica on her walk home and offered her a ride. She agreed to the ride as long as they took her straight home. She insisted that she wanted to go nowhere else. Victoria said that Cross almost immediately started to molest the woman in the car. When she fought him, he knocked her unconscious by hitting her in the head with a small ball bat that was lying on the floorboard. 
The group then took an unconscious Jessica to Burton's house, where Cross sexually assaulted her, then choked her with his belt while striking her in the head. When he was through, he insisted that the witnesses assault the body in some way, so as to implicate themselves even further. After they all complied, her body was wrapped in a blanket before it was laid in the garage and their party resumed. A day later, when everyone started to notice an odor, the group took her to the middle school ball field where they doused her in gasoline and set her body on fire, hoping to destroy DNA evidence. In March of 2007, after years of heartbreak, petitions, and marches, Quincy Cross and his accomplices were finally arrested and charged with the kidnapping, first-degree rape, and murder of Jessica Curran. At trial, with Caldwell as the chief witness, a jury took only hours to decide that Cross was guilty. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Jessica's mother, Jean, would tell reporters, You don't know how excited I am. I'm pleased and happy, happy for Jessica. It will always be hard because we don't have her, but this chapter in our life, we can get behind us. But Jessica's father, Joe, felt very differently. He would say, I can't celebrate with something like this. Nothing is going to bring her back, but justice needed to be done. It was bad what happened. It shouldn't have happened. Cross's accomplice, Tamara Caldwell, was sentenced to 10 years in jail, and Jeffrey Burton was sentenced to 15. Both Burton and Caldwell had entered Alford pleas in their defense. This means that they did not admit guilt, but conceded there was enough evidence for a guilty verdict. Because Victoria Caldwell and one of the other accomplices, Venetia Stubblefield, testified against Cross, they received less than 10 years apiece for their part in the Grizzly murder. Officer Tim Fortner, who had resigned from his position in 2003, went on to become a police officer in nearby Murray, Kentucky. Jessica's son, Zion, was raised by her parents, Joe and Jean. In 2008, he graduated high school in Mayfield, where he was an award-winning runner. Without their tireless work, their daughter's killer would not have been brought to justice. In 2009, Susan Galbraith was awarded the Kentucky Outstanding Citizen Award for her role in bringing Cross to justice. She called it the proudest day of her life. Quote, to know that I had just the slightest part in solving the crime. I just feel like I was meant to. Susan unfortunately died of natural causes in August of 2018 at the age of 58. Case cracked. We would like to thank BBC.com, Legal.com, the New York Daily News, CBS News, WKMS.org, and KFVS.com. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's story. Um, this is one of those cases you never want to hear about. It just seems like so many things were working against justice in this case, and I'm thankful that it finally really showed up. And I really think that Victoria um, did the right thing, especially knowing that she was going to face time herself for doing this, that she was actually part of the group that did these terrible things to Jessica. Uh, some other notes on this case. After the wrong suspect was arrested, Sheriff Ronnie Lear was forced to resign and could only find work as a security guard. When agents sent by the attorney general started researching the case, they found the local MPD so hostile, they demanded and received bodyguard protection from federal marshals while they were in town. Really seems like this town just had... Um, I don't know, there must have been some interesting power plays going on here for people to be so scared to talk and then for the PD to be so brazen about not cooperating with other law enforcement. I've never quite heard of anything like that in a case like this, but I'm sure it, it does happen. It may be more than we'd like to admit. Uh, Cross had been swabbed for evidence after a deputy sheriff found him in a broken down Pontiac that reeked of gas on the morning the body was found. I mean, think of how frustrating this is. They actually checked this guy out during the original investigation. But for some reason, that investigative thread just wasn't followed up when Caldwell walked away. And then Mayfield PD, they, they just seemed to lose track of Cross. Uh, makes you wonder if that's something that truly happened on accident, or if once again, there's 
some type of strange power play that's going on in this community. If you'd like to hear more details on this case, we have two links in the description box below to fellow true crime channels that cared enough to also look into this case. They both do amazing coverage. Big thank you to Moms and Murder and Crime Vault. And if you want to dive deeper, we've got those links for you right in the description box below. Big thank you to PayPal supporters, Tracy Knapp. Th thank you very much, Tracy. Really appreciate that donation. And also longtime supporter, Emma Rostron. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit www.lordandarts.com. There, you can sign up for PayPal, sign up for Patreon, or buy merchandise. All of it helps keep me here with limited commercials. You'll notice we never let YouTube inject ads in the middle of our presentations. As a matter of fact, YouTube went through and actually activated those ads in all of my videos last week, and I went through and disabled them in every single video. We need to be able to discuss these cases freely and properly, and in some instances, that means we can't run YouTube ads at all, just like on today's video. So thank you to everyone that helps support the channel. If you'd like to help me, and together we can continue learning about justice and how to keep ourselves and our families safe, please visit lordandarts.com. Wait, wait, wait. Did you think I was done with you guys? No, not yet. Not yet. Now, I know that you guys like listening to me talk here on the YouTube channel, but did you know that Crime Christie, our own Christie Arnhart, writer and producer on Case Cracked, has been kicking off into TikTok land. She's doing these awesome mini searchlights out there to help raise exposure to cases we've covered and some cases that we haven't covered. Uh, she's been growing at a really good rate and she's celebrating that growth with her first live stream. So if you wanna support the writer and producer of Case Cracked and associate producer on a bunch of other shows on my channel, please head over to Crime Christy at TikTok. The live stream is on Saturday, August 14th, starting at 7 p.m. Central Time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. I'll see you again on Wednesday with a new episode of Searchlight right here on the Lord and Arts channel.